So now coming to part two of our pre-scene analysis. Now part one, we dealt with the introduction to the company and we did a brief industry analysis, which was part of the pre-scene itself. So I hope you've understood everything in part one. I hope you've uh, gone through everything in part one and you're comfortable with everything in part one. My suggestion will be go through the industry analysis again, part one again, be comfortable with it if you're not already comfortable with it. So if you're not already comfortable with it, first have that knowledge of that much of the pre-scene, that part of the pre-scene. Once you are okay with that, once you have embedded that much in your mind, begin with part two because naturally part two is the larger of the two parts is the more substantial of the two parts and is the part where you will again have to pay a lot of care a lot of attention so part two we are starting with the directors of tracks europe we're speaking about the directors of our company the first we have the managing director managing director is tony roberts over here, they're telling us that Tony has overall responsibility for Trax Europe and is the key contact for group management. So if the agri group management has to have any communication about Trax Europe, they will reach out to Tony. Tony has been managing director for five years, previously been a product development director for another agri subsidiary. So he was working in another agri subsidiary and he was shifted to Trax Europe, making him the managing director. Tony was instrumental in securing the move of Agri's tractor product development center to Europe. So Tony was the main reason was one of the main reasons why he was persuading the Agri group to set up the tractor product development center in Europe. Now I always tell my students that knowing the manage the directors rather of the organization is important for two reasons the first reason is that obviously to understand your company you need to know the people who are running this company you need to know the people who are leading this company so that's the discussion that we are making one by one secondly to the the, the knowing the knowledge of the directors will give you important insights and important integration marks if you are smart enough. Let's say you're speaking about anything related to product development or you're speaking to, uh, you know, developing a new product, introducing a new product. The case study question is around these topics. You can simply start your answer or end your answer by including two lines saying that, uh, you know, according to me, tractor development will be important for our company, Trax Europe, but we should take the insight and we should take the help of Tony Roberts here because he has good background in the product development uh, segment and his insight will be very valu valuable for, you, for us. Now, when you write something like this, it tells the examiner that this person has studied the pre-scene. This person has knowledge of the pre-scene. So when you want to include integration, when you want to showcase your integration skills, further business skills, you can use manager names. So for two reasons, knowing the managers are very important. First, because they are the people who are running your organization. And second, you can use their names according to their competencies, according to what they are good at in your answer to add integration value, to add value to your uh, answer. This will bring business skill marks as well, integration marks as well. And this is so simple, one line which can really enhance your answer. So he's the person who's giving the subsidiary direction. He's giving Trax Europe direction because he's the managing director. Any instruction which the parents need, the parent needs to communicate to Trax Europe will come through Tony. Anything that Agri needs to communicate to Trax Europe will come through Tony. He has worked in another Agri subsidiary as product development director. So he knows the way the business works and he has the right background 
to recommend product development or the direction that the company has to take that's his competency product development direction the tractor development center has moved to europe now we know that does this mean that there is more focus on the europe market or are we looking to expand further into apac regions to capitalize the growth there so you are bringing your product development center closer to asia pacific that can also be one reason that said innovation brings risk this brings your risk and uncertainty models from the p1 the last two chapters of p1 surrounding risk uncertainty risk related decision making payoff tables into the situation here so the product development center has moved to europe so are we focusing on europe or are we focusing on areas around europe you can use his name for consultation while writing any product development or growth related topics like i said using director names will add value and we have given you all the ideas here next director we have production director jack newman now jack has responsibility for all aspects of the production facility and has been in the post for 10 long years having worked his way up from junior production management so he was junior production management and he got promotions got promotions and finally he is the production director at the top of production jack is passionate about production quality and has instigated many initiatives to promote total quality management throughout the facility so anything related to quality anything related to total quality management you know anything related to uh, improving the quality of our tractors you can use the name of jack you can use jack's name as a suggestion that okay we should consult with jack because he has worked his way up through the organization he's been in the post for 10 years he is the production expert and he supports quality so let's take his input you include these three lines in your answer it takes your answer to a different level that integration becomes a good part of your answer let me put it that way so he is well experienced he has worked his way up so he has encyclopedic knowledge in the process of production and would mean that he can be consulted on cost cutting assignments production assignments assembly assignments we can expect a scenario where our company is committing to tqm in the long term and hence knowledge about git tqm quality costs quality related costs which is part of your e1 syllabus and p1 syllabus are very very important from the case study perspective so you are seeing i am giving you links to our syllabus areas now studying those areas and going through those areas will obviously be your job next we have product development director so we have over here who only looks at product development Joe Steiner so along with the name of our managing director who was majorly instrumental Tony Roberts who was instrumental to bringing the tractor producting uh, the tractor product development center to Europe we have a dedicated product development director Joe Steiner as well so Joe is a mechanical engineer with over 20 years of experience in the field of tractor design and development so you can see he is an expert in his genre in his field he was appointed 6 months ago when the tractor product development director was uh, department sorry was moved to europe so once our uh, managing director tony roberts brought the product development department to europe we needed a product development director so joe steiner was appointed but he has 20 years of experience so joe is keen on embracing new technologies in engine design including the use of non diesel fuels so again anything related to new technologies engine design anything related to sustainability you can use joe's name so his experience will be invaluable in understanding what the need in the market is and suggest development accordingly because he has been an engineer for with 20 years of experience he is embracing new technologies in engine design 
and is willing to include non-diesel fuels. So sustainability in today's modern world is a major trend and a move towards the same will be a good marketing area for the business. This is something that you can market on that, you know, we at Trax Europe are proud because we are saving the environment by committing to non-diesel fuels. You know, something like this, if a scenario comes up. So sustainability is being promoted by one of the board of directors and this is a good competency for my business. Next, we have sales and distribution director, Rena Blois. Now, Rena has responsibility for all aspects of sales and distribution, including developing and maintaining relationships. Remember, you are selling through a network of dealerships and distributorships. You do not have your own showrooms. So having a good, great working relationship with these stakeholders will be very, very important. And this is Rena's job. Rena has been in this post for eight years and in that time has increased the dealer network by 20%. So the penetration of our tractors is increasing. First, maybe only five dealers were selling it. I'm giving an example. Now, more dealers are selling our uh, products. Hence, there is penetration. Hence, sales also increase. So, increasing dealer network can be seen as an important critical success factor for my business. Because if I want to grow, I need to increase my dealer networks. And that could be in and around Europe, in other countries as well. So Rena is looking at two very important functions, sales as well as distribution. Remember, sales and distribution are two different things. Sales is when you actually make the sales, when you actually sell a tractor. But the distribution is when the tractor from your factory reaches the dealership from where the customer is going to buy that tractor, pick up that tractor. So as the business grows, you may need to look at delegating these responsibilities and expanding the board of directors. As we grow, maybe expand into different countries. You may need a different sales director, different distributions director. So you can use a name for consultation while writing any topics on sales, distribution, marketing as well. She has increased the dealer network by over 20% and hence her management and relationship with the stakeholder group will be important, will be something that is good because she's been able to increase it, right? Next, we have HR. So, so we have a dedicated HR director and HR department as well, which is good to see because we are a good, big organization, multinational organization, let me put it that way. So having a same having the same structure and having good stringent employee categories and employee screenings is important and this can happen in a dedicated way if you have a separate hr department we have that with the hr lead being gina patel now gina has responsibility for all hr issues relating to tracks europe's employees and is an expert in employment law. Gina has over 20 years of experience in the field of HR and has been with Trax Europe for four years. She believes that a high level of employee welfare is key to a successful company. So we have a member of the board of directors who is uh, promoting employee welfare, who is committed to work for the employees. This is a good thing, right? This is a good sign, right? So HR is an important function for any organization as people make the business. HR management and issues are part of any business, especially a multinational. This brings in your HR related topics of uh, which are studied in your E1 syllabus. So she cares about the board of directors. Sorry, she cares about employee welfare. And if a, a member of the board of directors cares about this issue, then for sure, the business will also value this quality. If she's caring about employee welfare and she's discussing this at board level, obviously employee welfare is being given importance. 
So this can be considered a competitive advantage for us that we care about our employees. Trax Europe cares about our employees and hence good uh, qualified people want to work for Trax Europe. Now we have finance director Karl Lomas. So Karl has responsibility of all finance related issues including the provision of internal and external financial information and developing relationship with local finance providers because any business needs finance, needs money. Ours is a multinational business and a, and a capital intensive nature. Making tractors is not cheap. Having that whole production line and running that whole production line is not cheap. So we'll need money. So the relation of Carl with local finance providers is also important. He's a qualified accountant and has been finance director for two years. So he's been a qualified accountant for 15 years. So he would have developed a deep understanding of the value adding functions in an organization, cost cutting opportunities in an organization, and relation with local finance providers will be seen as something that is important. Next, we have the IT director as well. So it's good that our company has a separate IT department because as we know, IT and technology systems, internal technology systems are the most important for any business in today's modern world. So that's Priya Gold. Priya has responsibility for the smooth operation of all of Trax Europe's IT systems and for maintaining the company's website as well. So Priya has been in post for six months and has many ideas about how the IT systems used by the company could be improved. She is keen that the company embraces more smart technology. So more smart technology within the tractor manufacturing plus more smart technology on the website can be something uh, that is a commitment made by businesses in today's modern world to take the business forward because all businesses are about innovation are about technology now so she is involved in arguably the most upcoming or growth heavy functions of our company which is website and IT systems management. A positive sign for the business is that she is moving in line with the global trends and is asking to further embrace new technology. She is not someone who is taking technology for granted. She is trying to push the envelope. So website management. Maybe in the future we can launch an app. So app management where you have all your tractor layouts or all your tractor uh, videos or everything about your tractor on a mobile app and upkeep of the same will be key here. These are scenarios which can come up. So digital costing can also come up, becomes an important topic from P1. App management, website management, these are the digital aspect from your E1 syllabus is also very important. So website management, technological developments will be a key skill for our business. Online businesses are really succeeding. And if we are to harness the full potential of the same, our sales could see a good, reasonable growth. So we have a website. Customers are definitely coming onto the website. But are we collecting that customer data? If we are collecting that data, are we using it? Are we using data mining, data analysis techniques? This is your E1 syllabus because big data has its own advantages, own disadvantages, which you must know from the E1 syllabus. So we learned about the different directors within our organization and I told you directors are important because it tells us who is running this organization, their competencies, but it also tells us and also gives us an idea for integration when we go to mock question writing where we can use their names where we can use their competencies to increase my marks next we have key management teams within trax europe so key management teams within trax europe now in the operational case study exam they don't give us the organizational structure directly 
they'll not give us the direct structure of the organization they give us the breakdown of management teams now for sales we have at the top we already know we have rena blois we know her competencies but interestingly they are telling us that for tl end we have a separate senior sales manager for southern europe we again have a separate sales manager for northern europe we again have a separate sales manager so this is uh, so this tells me that under sales there is a geographical breakdown of departments there is a geographical breakdown of uh, areas or departments let me put it that way so over here what i'm seeing is under sales and distribution we have different directors for different geographies so we see here that each geographical area is broken down into a department over here responsibility of sales in tland has been given to gregor in southern europe it's been given to trina grig in northern europe is been given to thomas bills all three of these directors report to their functional head so the functional head is rena blois over here so the head is rena blois under her departments are divided based on geography for the sales uh, for for the sales management team now this tells me that this is a geographical based divisional structure for this department so over here a divisional structure based on geographies is being used in the sales department so centrally we have a functional uh, i'll say a functional organizational structure where there are different departments but under sales we have a geographical breakdown of departments and hence we can call it a geographical based divisional structure important for us to understand this that under sales there is a geographical based divisional structure and it has its advantages because you'll know how much the tland function is bringing in what are the costs of the tland function same for southern europe same for northern europe and different places might need different tractors so you can have different pitches as well it has its advantages so it's a good thing remember centrally there is a functional structure under sales there is a geographical based divisional structure which we can see over here and evidence of the functional structure is also very very visible for finance we have the finance director then we have finance manager and then we have the finance team where you are one of the finance officers so it's a functional structure centrally one department for production one department for sales one department for finance one department for it one department for hr under sales there is a geographical based divisional structure as we saw under finance there is a very simple functional structure as we are seeing over here same for production as well for production as well we have at the top production director then procurement manager warehouse manager production manager so this is again a very straightforward functional structure everything related to procurement under gill everything related to warehouse under tony smith everything related to production under dave pickett and all of these three people report to jack newman who is the production director now over here they are telling us that under production you have different uh, i'll say different tasks or different departments as well being engine chassis body panel main assembly testing which we are going to deal with which we are coming to one by one but right now know that for production as well and a functional structure is visible so as i told you currently we have a functional group structure seeing the images above we can say that a functional structure centrally is at place where similar activities are grouped together and there is a degree of specialization this is generally recommended for smaller sized organizations 
who work in a stable environment and who do not offer many many different kinds of products now for us we have nine different kinds of products which we have spoken about and we are going to add new products in the future because that is what the demand is to have small tractors as well so there is a possibility of us adding products firstly let's think about functional structure yes it has benefits because specialization each department is dealing with their speciality the scope of expansion today sales and distribution are together tomorrow sales department distribution department easily you can bifurcate it there's better control but the limitations are there is a long decision making process because for engine assembly pat will speak to dave dave will then speak to jack newman jack newman will then speak to the managing director so decision taking might take time and there can be conflicts between departments as well which always happens in a business environment so in the future we could be asked to move at a divisional structure you know centrally move to a divisional structure or a matrix structure as the organization continues to grow over here i'm going to ask you to go to your e1 syllabus and revise what a divisional structure is couple advantages couple disadvantages revise what a matrix structure is couple advantages couple disadvantages so to make a quick overview now of this director's picture that we've just looked at we have tony who looks at all aspects of the business and was key to bringing the product development center to europe carl deals with finance Joe deals with production. Rena deals with sales and distribution and she has increased the dealer network by 20%. Gina deals with HR and Priya deals with IT and wants the company to embrace smart technology. This is the scenario of my board. Currently functional structure, sales has a geographical based divisional structure, finance and production as we saw has a, has a functional structure as well now all of these are executive directors tony carl whatever we spoke about executive directors they are part of the day to day business running in the pre scene they have not given us any information about non executive directors in our f1 syllabus we have learned something which is called as corporate governance corporate governance states that you should have equal number of executive directors and non executive directors you should have a different chairman and you should have a different uh, ceo now these rules are for quoted companies or listed companies now nowhere in the pre scene have they told us about our status so we are not a listed company currently but still following the corporate governance guidelines is said to be best practice currently our company does not adhere to the corporate governance guidelines but as we continue to grow as we continue to expand into the future this could be something that we look at so the corporate governance aspect of your f1 syllabus the growth aspect the technology aspect in your e1 syllabus are important discussions over here i saw the opportunity to include an f1 topic i have done that for you over here so anywhere i bring up a topic it is then your job to revise it now pause the pre scene here and make sure that everything that we have covered up until now you are clear with that much you are okay with that much and then you move on now we are speaking about our manufacturing process now they will always give us our manufacturing process as part of the pre scene because they will want us to know how our products are made so in our case how the tractors are made now very interestingly in the production department we saw that there were different uh, reporting departments under the production head So if you see production senior manager who is Dave Pickett under him engine assembly chassis assembly all of these are different functions now these functions are one by one by one taken up over here and telling you what happens in each function 
so we understand our manufacturing process now again there are two reasons why the manufacturing process is needed to be understood first reason is obviously we are learning about our company how can you learn about a company without knowing what it really does what its processes are you can't learn right so that is why the manufacturing process needs to be understood secondly many a times in the exam they will tell you a question that for example in the chassis assembly department something went wrong now if you have not studied this and if you don't know what happens in the chassis assembly department will you be able to answer that question no matter how much e1 p1 and f1 knowledge you have if you don't know what happens in engine assembly or what happens in testing they tell you that a testing machine went wrong uh, if you don't know what happens in the testing department will you be able to answer that question with confidence i don't think so so two reasons why we are doing the manufacturing process firstly to understand our company secondly if any question comes up relating to any of the manufacturing process departments or production departments you should not be blank you should have knowledge and obviously when we are going through this we will relate to our e1 p1 and f1 syllabus as always that goes without saying now all the tractors sold by tracks europe are produced at the company's single production facility everything in one production facility we have already spoken about this earlier in the pre scene as to having one single production site versus multiple production sites something that you should keep in mind as we expand should we again keep continue uh, keep producing at this single facility or should we add another facility capacity planning do you have the capacity to expand in this production facility or not also needs to be thought about capacity planning is part of your p1 syllabus there are five production departments first there is engine assembly and this engine assembly goes to chassis assembly side by side body panel is being produced chassis assembly and body panel come together to the main assembly everything is assembled in the main assembly and then happens the final testing this is an overview let's go through the details so first engine assembly as the name suggests over here the engine will be assembled so in the engine assembly department engines are assembled from scratch using parts component and any other sub assemblies that are bought in from trusted suppliers you are assembling the engine but for that the parts and the components which you have purchased need to come in each engine is assembled on a block so that it can be moved through the department important thing over here is trusted suppliers remember quality is important something that our production department uh, production head is also pushing so the suppliers that we have are in relation with will need to be quality suppliers as well there are five stages to the engine assembly process each requiring different highly skilled specialist mechanics to assemble and fit the parts components and sub assemblies as required for that stage of process so we have highly skilled specialist mechanics so major costs of a manufacturing business is going to be cost of the bought in components because when you buy parts components sub assemblies they are not going to be cheap so cost of bought in components plus the cost of high skilled mechanics or labor staff do you think these they are going to be cheap they are highly skilled and they are specialist so their fees or their uh, i'll say their salary is going to be something that we have to keep in consideration so for a manufacturing business these two are the major costs the direct costs will be a big chunk of the final product cost so the direct costs which is uh, bought in components which is labor are going to be a big chunk of the final product costs traditional costing 
adds an average overhead rate to the direct costs of manufacturing products and it's best used when the overheads of the company are low compared to the direct cost of production. Now maybe as we go deeper into the pre-scene, we learn about our costing system, which is the absorption costing system currently, let me tell you. Currently our business is using the absorption costing system. So over here I'm giving you an overview of costing. So absorption or traditional costing is generally used by businesses when they're in their early stage, when direct costs are major costs of the production. For my business now, IT costs, which can turn out to be indirect costs, HR costs, other costs which are not product related are increasing. So activity-based costing identifies all of the specific overhead operations related to the manufacture of each product. And it might give you a more accurate costing of each product. This is generally used when overheads are high or you want to understand each single cost of your business to cut costs in a better way. So traditionally, every business uses traditional costing, absorption costing, like our business has been using till now. But a very realistic exam scenario can be moving to activity-based costing, the discussion of moving to activity-based costing, its advantages, disadvantages, this is part of your P1 syllabus. And when we go into financial budgeting analysis later on, we'll speak about this in further detail, but know that these are the two costing possibilities, which are often decisions which businesses have to make. And this is your P1 syllabus. So some stages require a single mechanic, other stages require multiple mechanics. As each stage is completed, the partly finished engine mounted on its block is moved to the next assembly area via an automated track system that runs through the department. So running this automated track also costs money. This turns out to be indirect cost. So indirect costs are increasing in this uh, industry. And that is why traditional absorption costing is not what all businesses are following. Next, when the engine assembly is complete, there is a quality control and testing check. Once it's complete, quality control and testing. Now our production director, Jack, is key to promote TQM. But with TQM, a GIT system could be beneficial for our company here because of our long-standing good supplier relations. Currently, we are not practicing GIT because we are checking after assembly and also assembling to store rather than when it is needed by the next department. GIT says that you don't need to have quality checks because the material that comes in will be high quality is checked when it comes in. Same way, material that comes in goes direct into production. There is no inventory. So when we have such strong supplier relations, we should we, should we not explore GIT as a modern business? And this was further strengthen our working capital position and cash position as well, because not everything will be tied up in inventory. You're not again and again and again and again checking. So P1 syllabus, E1 syllabus relating to quality, your F1 syllabus related to working capital and cash position is coming up into the picture over here. The engine assembly is then removed from the block and, and moved to the chassis assembly department by a system of chains, pulleys and winches where it is stored until it can be incorporated into a chassis. So as you can see, it is stored. So GIT is not being used currently. When TQM is being promoted with TQM hand in hand goes GIT as well. So this is something that can be looked at for the business in the future. Great, we have chassis assembly now. Now the chassis assembly was the second part. Engine assembly, engine assembled, moves to the chassis assembly department. Now the chassis assembly department is where the chassis of the tractor is created. 
This starts with a chassis frame into which the engine, transmission and gear, rear and front axles, steering system and so on are built into. What is a chassis? The chassis is the, uh, uh, let, let me say the aluminium or the steel structure that we are using. We are using high grade steel. So the steel structure, the steel skeleton of a tractor into which the engine, transmission, rear, rear tires, front tires, steering system, all of it is built into it. This has, happens in the chassis assembly department. So the chassis frame is made from sections of high grade steel, which are precision cut by a machine and welded together by robots. So the steel is cut by robots. This is the first mention of quality being a key concept of our product. Nowhere in the pre-scene till now they have been tell, they have told us that we are a high quality manufacturer or anything like that. This is the first mention of high grade steel. If you're using high grade steel, obviously the output is going to be good. It's going to be a high quality tractor. So it is important to note that our business is using automation and technology in its production system. Not everything is manual. More and more technology is important. Before any elements are added, the chassis frame is dipped into a vat of cleaning chemicals and then manually sprayed with a single coat of paint. So this is happening with robots where the entire chassis is dipped into a chemical pool and then it is sprayed with a single coat of paint. Chassis frame production is a mixture of mechanized and manual processes, both together. Now since labor is involved, since mechanism is involved, uh, the variances picture is coming to my mind over here. With manual processes and expansions in production come issues which need to be managed and possibility of variances is also coming up. What if you wanted to buy material for X price, your grade, uh, your steel for X price, but you couldn't. So your material price variance comes into the picture. What if your robots made a miscalculation and there was a miss, there was a failure in the production and that steel got wasted. So material usage variance comes into the picture. Same way labor variance comes into the picture. They can ask you material variance, labor variance related questions. You should be ready with that knowledge in your mind. The rest of the chassis assembly process is largely manual. To the chassis frame, front and rear axles and the steering system are manually welded into place. So can we uh, have, can, can we further automate this process? Let's think about that. The part finished chassis then moves along a production line to another section of the department where the engine is carefully mounted onto the chassis and the transmission and gear system is built into it. So chassis made, uh, the front and rear axles and the steering system is manually welded. Then in the end, engine is carefully added because obviously the engine is a very valuable component. A small inventory of completed chassis are kept ready to be moved to the main assembly department when required. So another evidence of JIT not being used, stored, everything is being stored. Now we will try to understand the bottleneck processes of our company as we go deeper into the pre-scene. Any breakdown or delay here would cause big repercussions for the business. What if there is a breakdown in the chassis department? There can, this can cause a repercussion for the business, right? So concept of maximizing throughput over here could be one that we should study and could be one that we should be aware of, maximizing throughput. So throughput accounting in your P1 syllabus becomes an important topic to keep in mind over here. Simultaneously, we have body panel production as well. Now the body panel production department Remember last department was the chassis production department. Now the chassis is the lower skeleton body, is the lower skeleton of the tractor where 
you know there is the uh, in the lower end of the tractor the wheels are fit in the lower end of the tractor the axles are fit the the transmission is fit it's the lower body of the tractor body panel is the top part of the tractor is the body of the tractor now the body panel production department is where body panels for the tractor bodies are made it's the actual body of the tractor which is seen these body panels include front and back wheel arches you know those arches and casing around the engine at the front of the tractor you know the casings of the engine the curves the actual body of the tractor is made over here to create the body panels large steel sheets are fed into hydraulic presses which are programmed to create the relevant shape of the door or the arch or the engine bonnet whatever once created the body panels are moved by machine to the painting area where they are first dipped in cleaning solution and then painted by robots each panel receives three coats of paints to ensure a high quality finish again quality is at the center finish is quality material being used is quality this part of the production is highly mechanized following a significant investment in new equipment Two years ago, so two years ago, new equipment was bought in this body panel production department. Now we can see that spray guns are being used, and the body panel department itself is highly mechanized. This is a good sign that we are investing. It's a modern business. We are looking at ways to make production more streamlined and more automatic. Now a large investment was made in new equipment two years ago. scenarios can be created around ias 16 property plant and equipment revaluation entry maybe some old machinery you uh, refurbished so that revaluation disposal maybe you sold some old machinery maybe the new machinery that you got is now become impaired so impairment of assets these are all scenarios which can come up in the exam so you must have knowledge of how ias 16 works how revaluation entry works how disposals work how ias 36 works they can also bring in ifrs 5 non current assets held for sale by bringing up a sale scenario they can say that the new machine that we invested in 2 years ago now we want to sell it for example how will it be treated so you will have to use non current assets held for sale for the recognition criteria for the reporting criteria this is f1 syllabus so engine assembly chassis assembly which is the lower end of the tractor body panel happens side by side engine comes to the chassis chassis and body panel together go to the main assembly department now the main assembly department is where tractors are put together on a large production line track the chassis and the product and the body panel are met over here at the start of the production line a completed tractor chassis delivered from the chassis assembly department is loaded onto a block which can be maneuvered up and down required and will move along the production track so the chassis is loaded onto a block which can move up and down the production track to fit the body panel on top of it to the chassis a cab which is brought in from another group company is moved into position remember tractor cabs i spoke about it at the very beginning now they're telling us that this tractor cab is not part of the body panel production and this tractor cab the place where the person sits and drives the tractor the cab with the actual seat and all of that is brought in from outside from another group company itself and it's moved into position using digitally controlled lifting equipment and it's manually connected to the chassis so to the chassis the cab is connected and then your body panels that you have produced are also connected all of the parts which are components sub assemblies are then added including tires lights front grills and the body panels that you made 
since we are buying from another group company here remember agri is a multinational organization it has different group companies one of which is tracks america tracks europe and it has other uh, you know equipment manufacturing companies as well so from one of those companies we are buying a ready made cab this means there is an internal transfer of this particular tractor cab you are buying it internally though it's a group company there will be a buying price there will be a selling price so the concept of transfer pricing comes into the picture here is a fair transfer price is is a fair internal transfer price between two group companies being followed is a fair internal transfer price between two between the buying company and the selling company which are both part of one group itself are being followed this is where your transfer pricing scenario comes into the picture which is very brief in the operational level but it's part of your f1 syllabus and hence i have mentioned it for you this also brings in group issues group loss relief group tax loss relief issues which is part of your f1 syllabus so these are important areas that you should have revised finally we have the testing department as well everything is ready now testing also needs to be done so all finished tractors are tested in the testing department before being certified as complete testing involves running the tractor on a specifically designed treadmill that simulates the tractor's working environment so testing needs to be done at the end and these are our production processes so now if they tell you that in the main assembly department uh let's say the chains to load the chassis onto the block have broken down we need to replace them you know that okay this happens in the main assembly department where the chassis is loaded onto the block this is where uh, the tractor cab and this is where the body panels are fit and the final tractor is ready you know this that is why this production process understanding section was important and that is why we gave it importance that is why we gave it its importance now other information about company operations is what we are going to so up until now they gave us production related information nothing more than that or nothing above that now we want to look at the other departments as well how does sales work let's take a look at that now all the tractors manufactured at the tracks europe production facility are sold to the end consumer in europe through a european network of dealers so they are sold in europe everything you produce in tracks europe is sold in europe only through a network of dealers in europe so not being exported to other continents currently only europe is being focused on so currently we do not sell anything outside of europe why is it a capacity issue then our capacity planning and further cash management needs to be spoken about is there higher demand and we are not being able to meet it so then we need to invest in increasing our production so is it because other subsidiary is catering to this market or is it because we have a capacity issue we need to ask that question here market development can be a good opportunity for growth because we know that in the asia pacific region there is huge growth all the tractors currently manufactured by tracks europe are for agricultural use again i will ask myself why as we have mentioned in the pre-scene non agricultural use is also gaining popularity so is there a chance to mold my tractor a little bit change it a little bit and sell it for non agricultural use as well product development comes into the picture and that thought is now in your mind therefore almost all of tracks europe's end customers are farmers because farmers are going to use agricultural products correct the sales inquiry and order process is as shown over here 
So firstly, the farmer needs to buy a tractor. The demand is generated. He can visit the Trax Europe dealer's showroom. He can inquire on the website which we have. He can inquire at Trax Europe stands that we rent out on agricultural trade shows. He has these three options. If it's a Trax Europe's website or an agricultural trade show, the inquiry is passed onto a dealer which liaises with the farmer. So we'll tell the dealer, okay, contact this farmer. Then the farmer engages with the dealer. The dealer liaises with the Trax Europe sales office to arrange delivery date and price. Farmer engages with the dealer. The dealer understands the farmer's needs, gives them the options. Okay. Then the dealer tracks, uh, talks to Trax Europe sales office to figure out the delivery date and the price. After this, side by side, the sales contract is signed between the farmer and the dealer. Side by side, sales contract is signed between dealer and Trax Europe. So we give it to the dealer, dealer gives it to the farmer. That's how it works. This is the actual organic process of how an inquiry is taking place. So now, is there an opportunity to open up our own experiential showrooms to get access to direct customer feedback and sales opportunities? Maybe open it up in one country or in one popular city or in an area which is prevalent, which has high demand. Open up one showroom, one of our own showrooms. We can have direct customer feedback. We can have direct relation with the customer then. Can be an opportunity. And again, if you have direct relation with the customer, your data topics come into the picture. E1 syllabus, I've been mentioning this repeatedly. Trax Europe has three regional offices. We already know this, Tealand, Southern Europe, Northern Europe. The sales department has a divisional based, uh, a geographical based divisional structure. Each sales office is located within the relevant region and as a sales team headed by the sales senior manager. We know this. Sales teams are set ambitious sales targets by the sales and distribution director and they earn commissions on top of their salaries based on the achievements of those targets. That's what always happens in sales. You'll give them extra motivation, extra commissions. Over here, I need to start to think that KPIs which are in line with the culture and the vision of the organization need to be thought of over here. Because employee motivation will be affected if KPIs are unrealistic. So start to think about critical success factors, about KPIs for my organization. This is part of my P1 and E1 syllabus. Now, the sales teams are very knowledgeable about tractor specifications and performance and are responsible for signing up new dealers, relation management with dealers, ensuring that dealers have sufficient promotional materials, dealing with the queries from dealers, dealing with online and telephone queries about tractor specifications, interacting with dealers, ensuring that dealers, uh, that tractors are distributed to the dealers according to the agreed delivery times. Now this is my advantage that my sales teams are very knowledgeable. I'm training them in such a way that they are knowledgeable. Now all of this information the sales team has or it's gathering one way or the other. We must ensure that all this information is gathered and then stored and then worked upon data again. The data gathered from the customer conversations or dealership or conversations can help us better our product and increase sales eventually. But for this, we'll have to store the data, work on the data, find the problems in the data, find the opportunities in the data. So data management opportunities are really, really present and prevalent. Each sales team is also responsible for setting up and staffing trade stands which we spoke about, you know, in trade organize, in trade functions or in trade fairs, we have our own stand which uh, showcases, tracks Europe. Customers come and ask questions there. This is the job of the sales team. 
Tracks Europe's sales contracts are between the company and the dealer rather than the end customer. I have no relation with the customer. I have a contract with the dealer. A sale is recorded by Trax Europe when a tractor is delivered to the dealer, which is only one or two days before the dealer sends it to the farmer. So I record the sale when it reaches the dealer. Sales teams have the authority to negotiate discounts with dealers of up to 15% of the normal selling price. Contracts with dealers specify that the price that the dealer charges to the end customer should be the price agreed between the dealer and Trax Europe sales teams plus an agreed percentage to give the dealer a margin. So you are controlling the price that is being charged. Over here, knowledge of CVP analysis and hence break-even margin of safety and the charts that are used to understand CVP or break-even chart, profit volume chart, multi-product break-even chart are important for us to study. Only then you can set prices. Only then you can offer discounts. Only then you can have negotiations. So CVP analysis, P1 syllabus, very, very important. You should have this background knowledge with you. Most customers or most dealers in our case are given a standard credit period of 30 days. Although some of the larger dealers have negotiated longer payment periods, but generally it's 30 days. Okay, so you receive your payment in 30 days. Next, relationships between dealers and the sales teams are generally very good. And most dealers pay within their ag agreed credit period. We have a good relationship. We know that. And they pay within the agreed period. Credit management will be key here. As if this is not managed, the working capital cycle will be adversely affected. This brings your F1 syllabus, receivable days, payable days, the working capital cycle. Also a good relation with suppliers and dealerships to ensure a smooth production process will be very important for our manufacturing business. Hence, relationship management becomes important. So, a relationship management from E1, uh, working capital management from F1 are important topic concepts which we must be clear about. Next, we are speaking about production facility. We spoke about production process. We speak about production facility now. Now, Trax Europe operates from a single production facility which is one of the largest in Europe. Okay, this site includes the Tractor Product Development Center, which was built six months ago. This is the, this is the Tractor Development Center for the Agri Group, for the entire group, with the function having moved to Europe from America. So our managing director had pushed for this center or this uh, function to be set in Europe. And the Agri Group agreed that, okay, let's move it. So maybe they are also focusing on Europe as the market now moving forward or they are looking at markets around Europe moving forward. Product Development Center also created six months ago. We see that we have two major investments recently in the past two years. If you see your product development center was created. Also, you had changes in the earlier department that we spoke about where, uh, you know, let me just move up to the exact department now to show it to you. So we also had a good investment in this body panel production department. Like they told us that it was highly mechanized following a significant investment. So body panel production department also got a huge investment plus the product development center, the entire function from America was moved to Europe. So in the past two years, lots of major investments have taken place. So any other major investments in the near future will have to be thought of. You know, you'll have to think about them. You just can't keep spending money. So the thought, you know, in your mock questions, if you're suggesting something that's completely radical, keep in mind that two major investments have been made by the business. 
So another major investment will have to be thought of. It can be made, but it has to be thought of. So this site, this production facility site includes tractor product development center, warehousing for raw materials, a huge assembly plant, which includes the engine assembly and all those other processes that we spoke about. Engine assembly, chassis assembly, body panel production, main assembly and testing facility. Finished goods warehouses are also present in this site. So production facility, the entire facility holds everything. Next, suppliers. Now to ensure quality, Trax Europe sources steel plates and paint from a single supplier. Both of these are large companies that service a lot of vehicle manufacturers that operate in T-Land. A discussion over here needs to be made on single supplier versus multiple supplier agreement. Single sourcing, multi-sourcing. Pause the video here. Take two minutes as an exercise. I want you to now solve it. Couple advantages of single sourcing, couple disadvantages. Couple advantages of multi-sourcing, couple disadvantages. I want you to think of it. Your job to think of it. Pause the video here. Until and unless you are ready, don't move ahead. Tractor cabs are bought in already assembled from cabs, which is a fellow subsidiary in the agri group. They've told us that we buy the cabs from a fellow subsidiary. Now they're telling us that the name of the subsidiary is CABS, cabs. Cabs is also based in T-Land and manufactures cab units for tractors and combined harvesters. We buy the cabs from them directly. Parts, components and sub-assemblies are brought in from suppliers which are mainly located close to the production facility. Many of the components and sub-assemblies are specific to Trax Europe and are made by suppliers using dyes and tooling that have been approved by, for use by Trax Europe. So we have good close relations with suppliers and we are, uh, you know, we have a long-standing relation with suppliers which is our competitive advantage. Supplier bulk discount and payment terms vary. Where feasible, the company does seek to take advantage of bulk discounts. Payment terms range from 30 to 60 days depending on the supplier. Now understanding the conditions of trade payables will be important here. Loyal suppliers are a competitive advantage for our business, but F1 syllabus relating to trade receivables, trade payables is an important syllabus area. Scenarios are often raised on it in the exam. Next, we have servicing and parts. Trax Europe does not provide servicing and repair services for its tractor. We sell it, our job is done. This is provided by dealers as part of their relation with customers. Now dealers have to deal with servicing, dealers have to deal with repairs. Now servicing and repairs seems like a non-core activity, which can be outsourced for the purpose of cost cutting. And this is something which our business has done. So this means that our business is open to outsourcing non-core activities. Because my core activity is to make the best tractor and sell it. Servicing has been outsourced. So throughout our process, think which other activities can also be outsourced to cut my costs. And or rather we'll keep a lookout for any other activities that we can cut or outsource to protect my costs. Trax Europe does though sell parts, components and sub-assemblies to dealers and to other agricultural equipment maintenance providers. We sell the parts, then fitting them and all of that is their job, not mine. Next, we have product development. Product development for all agri-tractors is undertaken at the Tractor Product Development Center located in T-Land, which has been recently moved to Europe. It's located in T-Land only. Product development involves developing new tractor ranges, 
new models, refining existing models. Within the development team, there are mechanical engineers and vehicle designers using computer-aided technology. So it's a good thing that we are using technology in this process and we have one whole development center which is looking at innovation, which is looking at development. It's a very good thing for any business, right? Because innovating is the way forward. For us, there is a large opportunity for us to include small tractors. Large opportunity for us to have non-agricultural tractors. Large opportunity for us to change our existing tractor models, refine our existing tractor models to serve with new latest technology. All of this will be possible because we have a dedicated product development or tractor development center. There are also mechanics and technicians that work on developing because development team must will say let's do this. But is it feasible? So mechanics and technicians are needed. They are also part of this. Within the center, there is a small foundry also which allows parts and components to be cast from molten metal and workshops where trial parts, components and sub-assemblies are created. Once a part, component or sub-assembly is developed, the development team liaises closely with suppliers to ensure that the exact specifications can be achieved. So as we can see, a variety of stakeholders is what we must deal with. Stakeholder management, relationship management, already spoken about, it's an important topic. Overall, key words to focus on that define my strategy. We are focusing on quality. We are innovating. We have an entire department focused only on innovation. We have strong supplier relations. We do not sell outside of Europe. And we have a good, knowledgeable sales team. This is the summary of what we have done up until now in one box given to you. Use these when you go to mock question writing. Please remember that this very, very detailed pre-scene is being made so that you can use these ideas when you go to mock question writing. When you are writing about our company, say that we focus on quality, we focus on innovation, we focus on regional selling. Include these points in your answers. That is why I'm going in so much depth. So this entire pre-scene depth is important because we have to understand our company first. But second, we are giving you these ideas so that you can use them when we go to mock question writing. You have substance to include in your answers. Last department is the employees. Now Trax Europe had the following average number employees. Production 3650, sales 190, admin 280, total 4120. You'll see that pretty much everything is part of production. Pretty much everybody is part of production. Admin is 280. Now 280 people I'm thinking over here to manage the most important functions of the organization. This is 7% of my entire workforce. So I'm assuming they've not given us any breakdown of admin. Right? They've just said admin. So I'm assuming that in admin, IT, HR, finance, accounting, distribution, marketing, every single thing falls over here. Everything except production and except sales falls under admin. That's what it means, right? So I'm thinking, is this enough? IT is growing. Our company wants to invest in digital technology. Expansion could be on the cards. Similarly, innovative marketing and HR techniques are being promoted all over the world. If my staff is under unrealistic pressure, they will not be able to perform and meet the goals. It's not possible. The finance function is also ever evolving. If unrealistic workloads are implemented, it will not be to the long term success of my company. So I found this as something interesting. That is why I brought it up. 7% to manage everything might not be enough. So an exam scenario where we are hiring or an HR issue or anything related to HR is something that can come up. HR is part of your E1 syllabus. Make sure you revise it. 
now we are moving to another crucial part of this pre-scene which is the financial analysis which is the analysis of the financial parts of this pre-scene where we are going to take each statement that they've given to us in the pre-scene analyze it learn about it understand it draw our conclusions of the same and then give you ratios and numbers and all the analysis and explanations that you need from the very onset please understand that you do not need anything extra or anything over and above what we give you any analysis over and above what we give you is going to be harmful analysis you don't need any extra detailing except for what we give you because then it will become a very uh, downward spiral where you'll just keep analyzing 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 and won't really learn anything from it so the amount of analysis we'll give you is more than enough and obviously to understand the nature of the company the financial strength of the company is very important for us to understand very important for us to gather over here so the financial analysis is a very important part of your learning process which i want you to first pay attention to so all of our statements are to the year ended 31st december and uh, it's something so what we'll do first is we'll take the actual statement of profit and loss that has been given in the pre scene and we have put in put it over here for you first we'll analyze the actual numbers they have given and then i will present to you my analysis on this statement of profit and loss your job will be simple follow me follow my explanations nothing else so let's begin firstly i will not confuse anything i will not change anything they have given us the numbers in millions so i will stick to the numbers that they have given us so if i look at revenue from the last year 2021 to 2022 the revenue has gone up good sign analysis how much percentage it's gone up by all of that is coming to you but right now let's look at absolute numbers only so revenue has gone up good sign for the business we know that this market is growing fine cost of sales has also gone up now obviously revenue increased because you sold more tractors you could sell more tractors because you produced more tractors and when you produce tractors more tractors rather the cost is proportionately going to increase so cost of sales has also gone up okay naturally gross profit went up which means that your cost of sales was well controlled because if revenue went up and cost of sales also drastically went up gross profit would not have increased gross profit has increased which tells me that revenue went up yes more tractors were produced yes but the cost was well controlled that's why gross profit was a positive 774 million which is an increase from the past year which is good next after this selling distribution and marketing costs have increase in this year maybe we spent more on marketing more on distribution it can occur but they're in the same range no drastical increase over here same way admin expenses increased but they're in the same range no drastical increases over here and because there were no drastic increases in your operating expenses your operating profit went up and it was healthy 260 million from this finance costs we'll see that finance costs have gone down now finance costs means the interest that you paid on your loans now there can only be two reasons for finance costs going down maybe you repaid the loan a part of the loan so you didn't have to pay the interest on that or maybe interest rates went down there can only be two reasons over here let's keep that in mind so profit before tax also increased from the last year a good increase your income tax went up 
obviously your revenue has increased so your income tax will also increase proportionately the more you earn the more tax you pay and eventually the profit for the year was 159 million but a good increase from the previous year where it was 121 million so over here we analyze these actual numbers we analyze the absolute numbers that they have given to us but if i tell you to remember 2990 as the revenue if i tell you to remember 260 million as the operating profit 31 million as the finance costs can get a little bit tricky right so i explained it to you yes but now what we do is we will give you our analysis we will give you our percentage based analysis to make your life very very easy if i tell you to remember revenue went up by 7% easier to remember right cost of sales went up by 6.7% easier to remember no i will not ask you to remember all of these numbers no absolutely not it's not humanly possible but i have asked you to go through the pre scene 5 10 15 times before the date of the exam so some of these numbers you can remember and why do you want to remember so that you can use it when you go to mock question writing so one of the very important reasons why we do this in depth financial an analysis is firstly understanding the financial strength of our company but secondly to give you this percentage analysis where you can use some of these numbers in your answer writing and automatically it tells the examiner that yes this student has really analyzed the pre scene spent time on the financial statements it adds value for example you are writing anything about growth cost cutting anything you can end your answer by saying our operating profit has gone up by a healthy 21% if we want to increase this cost uh, control is vital you know just end your answer with that line tells the examiner that the student has done their analysis it adds value so i explained the absolute numbers to you and what reasons could be there behind the up or down of these uh, particular categories but i'm giving you a, a, a percentage analysis as well so revenue has gone up 6.9 cost of sales went up by 6.7 your uh, selling distribution and admin expenses marginal 1 2% increases so nothing really substantial over there but operating profit went up by 22% revenue went up expenses didn't go up largely so profit is going to be good 21% increase finance costs have gone down because we repaid the loan and naturally because of that your profit before tax is healthy close to 30% so increase of 30% is a very good sign for the business right now why have i highlighted these in red maybe you can try to remember these numbers you know maybe it's in red that's why it sticks in your mind maybe you can try to remember these numbers you know any one or two if you can remember and then use them when the time comes it will really add value to your answer your operating margin also went up profit after tax margin also went up because the operating profit and the profit after tax both had increased so the margin is definitely going to increase all in all it tells me that the financial statements or the statement of profit and loss for this company specifically because that's what we've analyzed over here is on uh, is on the upward trajectory tracks europe is in a good place financially and everything that i spoke about has been put over here as my conclusion so all the reasons that i gave you have been put over here as my conclusion so we saw an increase in revenue first point second we saw a significant increase in operating profits because costs have not really increased decrease in finance costs there can be two reasons part was paid out or interest rate went down due to the decrease in finance costs profit before tax went up and profit after tax also has shown a good increase 
the effective tax rate decreased slightly but it's in the same picture your operating margin profit margin also has increased primarily because of the increase in revenue and the costs being controlled so overall company is in a good situation in terms of the statement of profit and loss this is the analysis of the statement of profit and loss and this same kind of in-depth analysis we are going to give you of each financial statement one by one by one now same way we have statement of financial position or the balance sheet whatever you want to call it again we'll make the same analysis first of the actual numbers the absolute numbers and then my analysis will present to you so when we compare the property uh, the non current assets property plant and equipment has actually gone down property plant and equipment has gone down means maybe depreciation effect or some part of the property plant and equipment has been sold two reasons why it can go down right depreciation as well as some part of the some machinery or some part of the property of plant has been sold the right of use of asset has also gone down what is right of use of asset when you have leased an asset the first thing that you do is record the right of use of that asset and then the corresponding liability is also recorded but first the right of use of asset is recorded which tells us that assets have been leased so your leases financial uh, ifrs in the f1 syllabus becomes really important because lease oriented questions have a great chance of coming up in the exam so have the knowledge about the leases ifrs from f1 i'm telling you from now itself obviously we are going to do a question on it but it's something that i want to want you to revise from the beginning so right of use of asset has gone down so maybe uh, the lifetime of some of the leased assets that we have uh, we had has been completed next we have current assets so if you look at current assets inventory has also gone down that's okay that happens in the business day to day trade receivables have gone up prepayments and other receivables pretty pretty much the same cash and cash equivalents have gone up significantly by close to 35 million so more cash is being held cash rich company right now total assets come up to 1783 as compared to 1774 million which was in the past year not a great increase not something which is completely catching the eye but two things i notice property plant and equipment and right of use of assets both which have gone down something to keep an eye out for we are now moving to the equities and liabilities section so firstly we have issued t dollar 1 equity share capital there's a asterisk over there at the end they have told us the trax europe has 1 million 1 dollar equity shares in issue which are all owned by agri because we are a 100% owned subsidiary of agri itself so 1 million in share capital completely owned by agri no changes there the retained earnings have gone up because your profit has gone up so obviously the profit is shown in the retained earnings is added to the retained earnings and hence the retained earnings has a good increase from the last year because mainly your profit has increased from the last year non current liabilities the borrowings have remained the same 800 million 800 million remember the finance cost had gone down the finance cost went down but my borrowings are the same so there is only one possibility now interest rates have gone down maybe we negotiated and got a better interest rate for ourselves that is why your finance cost has in has decreased right so borrowings that is something uh, that is one of the reasons that could have occurred uh, you know that that is one of the reasons why the borrowings have been the same but the finance cost has gone down another reason 
Another aspect to think about is that lease liability has also gone down. Now lease liability went down, your right of use of assets also went down, which means maybe a lease agreement has come to an end or maybe the useful life of the asset has come to the end. That is why the right of use has also gone down, lease liability has also been completed and hence gone down. F1 syllabus on leases becomes very very crucial over here. And because the lease liability has gone down, the interest factor which is related to the lease is no more to be paid. And because interest is no more to be paid, that implicit interest rate is no more to be paid, overall your interest has also gone down which we saw in the statement of profit or loss. Coming to current liabilities now. In the current liabilities, trade payables gone down, accruals and other payables in the same zone, tax has gone up, we've seen that in the profit or loss statement. Lease liability for the current year pretty much remained the same. So if you see, there are no massive changes in the current liabilities or the current assets. There are changes in the non-current liabilities and the non-current assets which we have spoken about. Coming to my analysis now. Now if I look at my analysis, I have a great ratio analysis ready and present over here for you to draw from. We looked at the absolute numbers, we discussed why this could have happened or that could have happened, all of that. But one ratio which we calculated is return on capital employed. Now this is important because we want to know if this function of Trax Europe is profitable or not. Agri will want to see, our subsidiary, our owners will want to see, the shareholder which is Agri will want to see how much money did I invest in Trax Europe and how much did I get back. So that's your ROCE, return on the capital employed, return on the money that you invested in this business, how much did you get back from it. So if I look at the ROC, it's operating profit upon capital employed. It has gone up because your operating profit has gone up naturally. So operating profit went up by a good margin, your ROC turns out to be 21-22%. So again, you this is, this is a number which you can try to remember and use when you go to mock question writing. Why not use it? Same way, non-current asset turnover, pretty much in the same region no alarming changes over here. It's gone up because the revenue has increased and the non-current assets have gone down. It went up, which means you used your assets efficiently. Instead of the assets going down, your revenue increased, which means you are efficient in your asset usage. But it's not an alarming change. It is a change. It's gone up. It's good for the business, but it's in the right zone. Current ratio, quick ratio, I will not say that there are massive changes, but there are changes. Current ratio has gone up, quick ratio has also gone up. Same way, return on assets, a good increase. Return on assets is calculated as net income upon total assets. Your income has gone up, assets have gone down. Return on assets has to increase. One very important thing which I see over here is gearing, which we calculate as debt upon debt plus equity. If you see your gearing, your equity is over here. Let's come, in, let's come back. Your equity is 1 million. Gearing debt is 800. Now we see that this is a business that is highly geared, that is a highly geared business because it's a business which, uh, you know, is, is working majorly on outside finance. So total equity, 203, debt upon debt 
plus equity is how we have calculated this. And it comes up to close to 82% for this year, which means it's a highly geared company. A highly geared company means that it's using outside finance as its majority finance. Now gearing is good for a company, but to this extent, it can turn out to be risky because what, because, because it's, because a loan has been taken, you have to pay the interest, right? What if tomorrow the company's revenue takes a toll, something happens where the revenue is affected. Will you still be able to pay the interest? That's the risk with debt, right? Now, where this debt has been taken from, there is no insight. Has Agri given us the loan or have we taken it from the bank or have we taken it from somewhere else? We have no information on that. But a, a highly geared company like this, 82, 83% of finance coming from debt means that this is a company that will be considered risky. But we are a 100% owned company of Agri. So we don't really have any shareholders who we have to please. We don't really have any shareholders which will think twice before investing in this business. Yes, if Agri is looking to sell part of the business, then the gearing might be quite alarming because such a highly geared company means it's a risky company. The more the gearing, the more risky the company is assumed to be. A gearing ratio of 30, 40% is okay acceptable but a highly geared company over here is something that showcases signs of risk but since we are a hundred percent owned subsidiary of agri this is something that is not of huge alarm this is something that is not of huge consequence because where we have received that debt from does not have any substance in the pre -seen. Yes, if you now go to raise a loan from the bank, the bank will tell you, your gearing is already so high. You know, uh, why should I give you a loan? If I give you a loan, I'll give it to you at maybe, you know, two, three more percent than the market rate because you are a risky company. So moving forward, the path for Trax Europe should be to reduce its gearing, which, can, which it can do by introducing more equity by introducing equity, by raising equity finance, by raising equity finance in the business. That's one of the ways the gearing can be reduced. And it's something that should be looked at because 82, 83% gearing is something that is quite alarming for a business and something that we must keep in mind as a very important parameter over here. So coming to my conclusions, everything that I spoke about has been put as words for you over here. So ROC has gone up, good sign. The non-current asset turnover gone up, good sign. Current ratio and quick ratio indicate the liquidity of the company. A ratio of less than one would indicate that the company does not have enough short-term funds to cover its short-term expenses. In this case, the current ratio and quick ratio increase slightly, but it's still less than one, which is, which is not optimal. So my statement of profit and loss was pretty strong. My statement of financial position has some weaknesses, specifically my working capital cycle. So a question on the working capital cycle can surely come up because your current ratio, your quick ratio is less than one. It's not where it's supposed to be. It is reasonable to say that the company faces some short term liquidity risk. So managing your receivables, managing your payables will be important. The return on assets has increased. Yes, the gearing is a measure of how much of a company's operations are funded using debt versus equity. One can clearly observe that the company is highly leveraged. This exposes to the company to financial risks as well. Now, if the company faces short term cash flow problems, then it may be difficult for the company to pay interest on that debt and overall pay that debt back also. If there's an increase in interest rate, the burden would increase on the company. So it's something which is alarming 
there can be two things why this has been accepted one we'll have to first figure out where this debt finance has come from no information is in the pre scene if agri has given us this debt then okay but if this debt has come from an external source then this gearing is not acceptable because agri is our owner if they have given us the debt finance of 800 million and we are paying them the interest then it's an internal transaction which is still acceptable but if you go to raise finance outside of the business your gearing is looked at and it will not be favorable for trax europe so our financial position was strong uh, our uh, statement of profit or loss was strong financial position has some problems which we have spoken about and which you must keep in mind because that's the eventuality of our company right now now we are speaking about the statement of cash flows then now statement of cash flows as we know is divided into three parts operating activities investing activities and financing activities so we'll deal with all three one by one by one first operating activities profit before tax is what we start with which was 229 which we saw in the statement of finance profit and loss as well to this there are some adjustments adjustments being depreciation for property plant and equipment property plant and equipment had decreased remember so depreciation is something that had occurred it needs to be adjusted over here depreciation on right of use of asset also mentioned over here and finance costs also mentioned over here if you look at these depreciation is a non cash expense it's something that has to be made an adjustment in terms of cash flows in terms of how the cash is affected so if you look at it these adjustments total to 210 million this needs to be added back because these are not cash expenses these are expenses only which happen in the book so 210 cash uh, adjustment needs to be made added back movements in working capital inventory has decreased trade and other receivables have increased decrease in trade and other payables total comes up to 51 million in brackets so i'll do 229 plus 210 minus 51 gets me to 388 which is my cash flow from operating activities now it is very clear that depreciation is a non cash expense added back it is something that occurred that is why your property plant and equipment had gone down same way depreciation on right of use of asset is something that had gone down so included again finance costs again gone down included over here so after making all of these uh, adjustments your cash generated from operations turns out to be 388 million as you can see on your screen next cash flow from operating activities is not yet completed because the tax has to be adjusted interest has to be adjusted so tax paid 56 interest paid adjusted over here so if you see there is a very clear relation as to how it's presented because finance costs are added back in your operating activities calculation at the end you deduct the interest that was paid again 31 million so you get your final net cash inflow from operating activities it is very clear that some part of the lease has been paid back or the lease has ended Sec uh, secondly property plant and equipment has gone down because of depreciation so far next cash flow from investing activities property plant and equipment negative 121 million which means some property plant and equipment has been sold because only when you sell you get that money right so i am looking at selling scenario over here but they are telling me 
that purchase of property plant and equipment has occurred of 121 negative which means you have purchased you have paid money so cash flows from investing activities have the purchase of a property plant and equipment now this is quite contradictory because in my statement of financial position property plant and equipment has gone down which means depreciation occurred yes property plant and equipment was purchased yes but still the number remained below last year's number so two things to keep in mind purchase was made but still depreciation was a larger factor than the purchase and hence your property plant and equipment has reduced next we have cash flows from financing activities dividend paid now naturally this dividend will be paid to the shareholders we have only one shareholder which is agri so 120 million was the dividend paid to agri Agri took out that money from our business and repayment of lease principal. Right of use of asset has gone down. Lease payment, lease principal has reduced. So net cash flow from financing activities turns out to be a negative 145. So operating activities total minus investing activities minus financing activities gives me the increase in cash or cash equivalents which is 35 million from this at the start of the year i had 14 million increase was 35 so at the end of the year i have 49 million remaining this is what the statement of cash flow means simple as that and the conclusion of the same has been given to you over here Working capital increased, which we saw in our quick ratio and current ratio, but they are still below the needed threshold. Overall, there was a positive increase in cash flow. We know that depreciation is added back. Finance cost is also added back. Like I told you, investing, we purchased property, plant and equipment this year. Financing dividend was paid. And a principal of the lease amount was also paid. Overall, there was a net increase in cash flows, which I have just explained. This is your cash flow statement analysis. Pause here. Go through statement of uh, profit and loss again. Go through statement of financial position again. Go through cash flow statement again. Once you are comfortable with these three, then you move on to the next step. As part of the financial analysis itself, we are going through the budgetary analysis. So there are some budgets that have been given to us, which we naturally have to overview. So financial statements, profit and loss, statement of financial position, cash flow statement, we went through all of that. We know the projections of for our company and we know the situation of our company currently. Now they're giving us some budgets. Now budgeted gross profit for this particular year has been given to us. But this time they have broken it down into tractor wise, into product wise that we sell. So if you look at our sales revenue overall, you will see that the major sales the product that we sell the most is A plus tractors because A plus tractors has a bigger revenue than any other product that we offer. Let's look at them one by one by one. Now sales revenue for A double plus is 596,500. Reduce the cost of sales, you guess the gross profit. And the gross profit margin has been given to you as 36.3%. For A+, plus, gross profit margin is 24.4%. For A power, or normal A, 21.5%. For parts, the gross profit margin is 40%. Now this tells me that revenue contribution by each segment, 18.5% of the total revenue comes from A double plus. 58.45% comes from A plus. 
19.2 percent of the total revenue comes from a and 3.8 small percent comes from parts now what i am trying to tell you over here is for my business i am selling a plus the most but is a plus the most profitable product for me no a plus is the third most profitable product the first most profitable product is parts which is not my core business i understand that second most profitable product is a plus plus third is a plus and fourth is a power a, a the a category if i look at this it clearly tells me that the product which i'm selling the most is not the product which is the most profitable for me so is there any way where i can increase my a plus plus sales because it's going to give me more profit right is there any chance that i can increase the sales of my parts as well because that is the highest profit margin product for me but the major cash cow for us the major uh, hit product for us is a plus so this is the category that we will have to focus on we'll try to improve our profit margins here but also focusing on parts also focusing on a plus plus so a plus is the product that we sell the most but it's not the most profitable product for my business know that understand that and this is only possible because we are doing this breakdown with you because we are doing this you know uh, just the breakdown and the analysis with you over here which is going to further continue as well moving on they'll give us each tractor category one by one by one now let's start first is a double plus analysis total sales volume remember in each category we have three products basic regular premium the selling price is 100000 for basic 155000 for regular and 200000 for premium and your total sales revenue of this category is 596500 which we know okay now what do we understand from this the table shows the expected sales volume of each module okay we expect to sell 4100 units in total out of which regular model is the most popular one because 56% of the total a++ tractors that we sell are regular so regular is going to be most popular then basic and then premium in terms of contribution to sales revenue we expect the regular model to contribute 60% of the total sales revenue followed by basic followed by premium both of which are 20 20% why am i telling you this because if any if anywhere in the exam question we are speaking about the a++ power range you know that okay the most selling product is the regular product priced at 155000 and majority of the sales of this product are in the regular category then basic and then premium this tells us as a business that this is my most profitable product so this is the product that i should be focusing on this is the product that i should be marketing around this is the product that i should promote because people are buying this people are already liking it so what if i promote it in a better way what if i promote it in a way where i get more reach for this particular product but it's only possible if we do this analysis that we are doing if we do this uh discussion that we are making right now now interestingly they are giving us the a++ power range cost of sales cost of sales meaning sales breakdown the cost breakdown sorry the sales breakdown was given in the previous table now they are giving the cost breakdown to you so the total sales volume have been given as 1200 2300 600 we know that but now they are telling us which where the costs are committed so as we know in our business majority of the cost is going to be raw material and direct labor which is very true over here majority of the cost over 50% of the cost for each tractor that you pick is raw material and direct labor combined then 
वेरिएबल प्रोडक्शन देन फिक्स प्रोडक्शन ओवरहेड्स सो देर आर ओवरहेड्स ऑल्सो ट्वेंटी एट थाउजेंड रफली इज द ओवरहेड इन द बेसिक कैटेगरी ट्वेंटी सिक्स ट्वेंटी सेवन थाउजेंड इज इन द रेग्युलर कैटेगरी थर्टी थाउजेंड ओवरहेड्स इन द प्रीमियम कैटेगरी इट इज वेरी क्लियर दैट अ अब्जॉर्प्शन कॉस्टिंग सिस्टम इज बींग यूज ओवर हियर which they'll tell us also deeper into the pre seed but because it's the absorption costing system we don't have the breakdown of the variable production overhead we don't have the breakdown of the fixed production overhead we don't know that so to have a better understanding activity based costing could be something that the business is looking at although variable production the overheads are a small percentage of the total cost but when you multiply it by the amount of tractors that we are selling it will turn out to be a large large sum so if you are able to understand it in a better way maybe we can cut costs this is why this cost of sales analysis is important to showcase to you that yes majority of the cost is raw material and direct labor but some part is also overhead which if understood well can be a bifurcated and can be an area where you cut your costs so this is given in my analysis the total production cost has been given over here and the total volume has been given over here the raw for raw materials this includes the cost of all the materials that have been used in the production process we know that we use steel and aluminium and high grade steel steel sheets all of that total has been given here same way for direct labor we know that we have wages we have highly skilled um, uh, highly skilled engineers sorry we have highly skilled people who are working for us we we'll have to pay them next variable production overheads this could include electricity water bills everything because there is no breakdown over here fixed production overheads includes your rents your salaries for management staff all of that falls under this category and to calculate the total cost we'll just add all of this so this has been given to you in my analysis over here but the major understanding was that raw material direct cost is a big chunk but overhead cost which has no breakdown is also a significant percentage if we understand well we can maybe uh, cut costs we can maybe uh, focus our uh, pricing in that way if a good costing is if a good costing table is created and understood we might be able to price our tractors in a better way this was for a plus plus same tables same analysis now given to you for a plus power range the second model but the most popular one the second tractor or the most popular one the tractor that we sell the most so over here total sales volumes have been given to you selling price has been given to you you will see that the selling price is lower than the a++ but it again has three categories basic regular and premium again the regular one is selling the most the table above shows the expected volumes we expected to sell about 19600 units out of which regular is 46% basic is 33% and premium is 21% so this is the trajectory for a plus power range where again regular model is selling the most most popular one and is bringing in the maximum revenue as well is there a chance i start i need to now start to think is there a chance where the basic tractor sales can be increased premium tractor sales can be increased so maybe if you want any discount offers or want to bring in discount offers you might think of bringing them in the premium category maybe a 5% discount or a 10% discount to increase the sales volume in that particular segment still it will give you a good gross uh, gross profit margin so if you have extra capacity this is something that you can think of because this analysis is being made same way the cost of sales is now given so if you look at the cost of sales most the the product which takes the most cost to build is the premium product but again over here majority of the cost is raw material direct labor cost 
but a good percentage is your production overheads as well. So to understand the production overheads, an activity-based costing system could be something that you can move to, could be an exam scenario that we think of. So again, if we break it down raw material wise, majority of the cost is going into raw material and direct labor. Production overheads is still a good percentage, still something which you need to understand. And the resulting figures are these which I have mentioned. Finally, these figures are added together to arrive to the total cost of sales, which comes up to 1424801. I don't want you to remember these numbers. It's not possible to remember these numbers. I don't want you to. But I've created the analysis for you to make you understand that the regular model is selling the most. That raw material and direct labor are made majority of your costs. Variable and fixed production overhead, if you want to understand, the options are a better costing system. That is what we are trying to showcase to you over here. It's not possible to learn these numbers, so don't try to do that. Again, so for A++, regular was most uh, prominent. A plus regular was prominent. A regular again is leading, but over here, premium takes over. Premium is 4,200. Regular is 3,900 and 1,100. So it can be said that if you have a cheaper option available, people are going, going for that because nowhere in the other categories, premium is being sold so much. So in the A plus power range, why is premium being sold the most? Maybe because it's affordable. So we can say that the trend in this market is towards affordable tractors, but innovative ones, but with good technology, but with good inbuilt supporting systems like the premium tractors have. We've spoken about this in the beginning of the pre-scene. So over here, this table shows the expected sales volumes maximum to be premium, then regular, then basic. In terms of contribution, majority of the contribution is coming from premium because that's what we are selling the most, then regular, and then basic. Same way, a cost of sales has also been given over here now. If I look at the cost of sales, we will see that the total production cost is the most for premium, naturally, then regular, and then basic same trend is followed throughout. Again, nothing to learn over here, but to understand that majority of your costs are raw material and direct labor. Production overheads are also a good percentage, which you must be wary of. So from this budgetary analysis that I have presented, I want you to take away in A++ category, what is selling the most? Which costs are the most? In A plus category, what is selling the most? Which costs are the most? In A category, what is selling the most? Which costs are the most? This is something that I want you to take away from these three uh, budgetary analysis charts that we have done, that we have prepared. Now coming to an example cost card. Over here, they've given us the example cost allocation or cost card for the A plus power regular model, which is selling the most, which is the most selling product in our entire offering. What is this standard cost card? This standard cost card means what is the cost of one A plus power tractor? So material is allocated by the piece rate. So if you use an 11 meter square steel plate, it costs you $85. That's what it mentions. The cab costs you $23,000. You buy it from outside, remember. The paint costs you $416. The parts and the components and the sub-assemblies you buy from somewhere else costs you $21,000. So the material is costing you $45,000, which we know is the major chunk. Next, labor. Engine assembly. You spend 60 hours, it costs $30 per hour, costs you $1,800. So labor is based on the labor hours taken for each production category. 
subsequently total comes up to 4040 so majority of your cost is already committed in the material and the direct labor next variable production overhead something interesting to see and understand over here engine assembly they are attributing it based on direct labor hours dlh is direct labor hours so how much ever time it took to uh, you know they, they are not breaking down the engine assembly in the engine assembly department a lot of activities are involved they're not breaking it down they're just saying that engine assembly took 60 labor hours so okay this is my cost this is how i calculate it nothing else and the total cost is then attributed same way chassis same way body panel same way main assembly same way testing they're not giving a breakdown of what in testing what in machine assembly what in body panel production you know was it uh, setup costs or was it uh, uh, you know what was it inspection costs was it uh, whatever they're not giving the cost breakdown here they're just saying engine assembly took 60 labor hours okay this is my cost multiply and use that's not how costing should really work like this is very simplistic for a big company like ours such a simplistic costing system can cause issues in decision making so variable production overheads this way it's calculated fixed production overheads again same they're not telling me which staff salaries or uh, you know which management staff salaries are included in engine assembly or what is included in fixed production no details directly based on labor hours this is my total and then comes the total production cost of 72781 but you'll see there is no breakdown in variable production there is no breakdown in fixed production this happens when you use a standard absorption costing system so my analysis is very clear over here the total standard cost for producing one unit is 72781 standard cost is broken down into three parts materials direct labor and production overheads for material the materials category includes cost of all materials i already explained that direct labor includes all the wages part variable production overheads are indirect costs which vary with the level of production so you know electricity water bills anything which is variable gets included over here but again they have not given us any breakdown engine assembly this much chassis assembly based on direct labor hours but shouldn't electricity be based on kilowatt hours used or the number of watts used shouldn't water bills be based on liters of water used they are basing everything based on labor hours is this the right way of costing in a standard costing system yes it's a simplistic way of costing but it might result to inaccurate costs and hence inaccurate decision making same way fixed production overheads nothing is broken down how much rent how much salaries for management staff we don't know that because no breakdown is given so from this standard cost card we again learn the same thing that variable and fixed production overheads need to be understood in a better way which is only possible if the costing system is changed after understanding this standard cost card they have given us some notes on the standard cost card and the budget preparation as well they're telling us that the company operates a standard absorption costing system thanks for letting us know they told us in the end when we already figured it out this should in my opinion this should have been explained above in the pre scene and then the budget analysis and all of that given but okay the company operates a standard absorption costing system already we've discussed that for a big company like ours which is progressive in its thinking innovative in its thinking and we have different kinds of products in different variances and different variants a robust costing system is important a move to activity based costing can be definite exam scenario so revise activity based costing thoroughly i will say know the concept in your own words this means that all the costs they're they're speaking in relation to absorption costing now 
This means all the costs associated with producing a product are included in the cost of the product. Your direct material, direct labor, variable overheads, fixed overheads, as we have seen. The standards are reviewed and updated annually. Every year, the standard is updated. Throughout the year, are there no changes? Throughout the year, steel prices remain the same. Labor prices remain the same. Paint price remains the same. It's not ideal, right? So if you're using a standard cost card, then 100% there is going to be the chance of a variance. So variance analysis, definite exam question. I'm giving it to you right now itself. In one of the variants in the exam, variance analysis will be asked. Activity-based costing will be asked. 100% I'm saying. So, and also this is one of the drawbacks of the absorption costing system because every year you are making a cost card rather than updating it every three months or six months. This means that the company reviews its standard costs for each product on an allule basis to ensure they are still accurate. So why do we need to review standard cost cards? Because naturally the quantity might differ the costs might differ, the labor quantity differs, the labor cost differs, and all of this costs variances. So if you don't update it, your variances will be larger and larger and more larger. Next, normal raw material losses are included in the standard cost of each product. So material usage variance coming into the picture again, because while making your tractor, some material is lost. So maybe normal loss is one steel plate, for example, I'm saying, which amounts to uh, whatever, let's say $10, for example. What if you waste two steel plates? It's possible, right? Even if you're using robots. So your variances come into the picture. This means that the cost of any raw materials lost during the production process is already included in the standard cost card. Next. All direct labor overtime premium is treated as variable production overhead and idle time is not budgeted for, which means you are assuming that it's an ideal production system, 100% efficiency. Is that possible? I don't think so. So again, a variance will arise. Idle time variances do definitely arise. Labor variances definitely arise. Moving on. Production overheads are allocated and apportioned to production cost centers and absorbed on labor hours or machine hours. There are five cost centers, each of them being the five production departments, engine assembly, chassis assembly, body panel production assembly, your uh, final assembly and testing. Each is a cost center which costs are attributed to Standard selling prices are after expected dealer discounts. What if the discount is larger? What if you offer a larger discount or an offer that you are offering? So your sales variances come into the picture. After this, they are telling us that budgets are prepared on an incremental basis. Now, incremental budgeting system is what our business follows. The different budgeting systems and its benefits need to be thought of over here. Incremental means every year we'll add a percentage to the budget rather than looking at it from zero. So this year's budget, let's say, is uh, for the A plus tractor is 75,000 in terms of the cost. Next year, 10% increase, let's count and we'll set that as the budget. But what if actually 10, it's more than 10% or less than 10%? You're missing that out, right? This was an example that I gave you. So this is the flaw of an incremental budgeting system. What other options do you have? If you move to ABC, then you have activity-based budgeting. You have zero-based budgeting. These are options which are available and which are part of your P1 syllabus. So you should know different budgeting systems, couple advantages, couple disadvantages. Last but not the least, Operational managers have limited involvement in budget setting, which means everybody is not involved. The top management tells the bottom management what to do. Bottom management has to follow it. Today's modern businesses work in this way. 
again chance to better so this paragraph mentions the use of a top down approach where budgets are set by the top management and the lower level managers simply follow it this would not seem to be very beneficial today in today's modern business dynamic environment on the other hand you have a bottom down approach where everybody sits together and sets the budget participates and sets the budget both methods have their advantages and disadvantages so top down approach couple advantages couple disadvantages i'm thinking about bottom down approach or participative approach couple advantages couple disadvantages i'm thinking about this is your homework your assignment this brings me to the news analysis section now the news analysis section is something that has been already broken down for you something that has been already summarized for you from the pre scene you don't have to do anything extra except for simply read it we always give the news analysis section for students to read simply read it here i will also ask you only for this part the actual seema pre scene is something that you can refer to for the news analysis section to read through the original news analysis section then the analysis has already been created over here already given to you as part of my pdf so read through that and then read through this you are covered so first analysis done over here second news analysis article done over here you simply have to read it third news analysis article done over here you don't have to do anything extra simply have to read it that's the news analysis section covered now we are speaking about the tax regime in tealand now the corporate income tax rate is 30% any profits that you make 30% tax you will pay on that simple as that unless stated otherwise accounting rules on recognition and measurement are followed for tax purposes so normal rules are followed the following expenses are not allowable for tax purposes depreciation amortization impairment charges when you are calculating your tax the following expenses you cannot claim under tax provisions under tax purposes remember your accounting profits calculation remains as it is normally this is calculation of your tax profit so the following expenses are not allowable for tax purposes accounting depreciation any amortization impairment charges you can't say that my profit was this much but my impairment of my asset was 5 million i will not pay any tax profit was 10 million impairment charges 5 million depreciation 2 million amortization 3 million profit zero so zero tax that's not how it works these expenses are not allowable for when you are calculating your tax purposes so accounting depreciation amortization impairment entertainment expenditure donation to political parties tax paid to other public bodies you say, you can't say i paid tax over here so i won't pay you tax no tax has to be paid so what expenditure is allowable what expenditure is not allowable has been explained in your f1 syllabus beginning chapters so please make sure that you revise that particular aspect next tax depreciation allowances are available on all items of plant and equipment at a rate of 25% per year on a reducing balance method plant and equipment as well as computer equipment tax depreciation allowance can be claimed remember tax depreciation is allowed for plant and equipment not for property assets because generally the value of property increases no tax depreciation allowance is allowed on property it's only allowed on plant equipment and computer equipment that's what they've specifically mentioned this is the rule of the land this is what we will have to follow because we are 
Prax Europe. Remember that. Now, some students might have a thought as to what is tax depreciation. It's already there in your F1 syllabus, but I will mention it for you. Tax depreciation is the depreciation expense claimed by a taxpayer on a tax return to compensate for the loss in the value of the tangible asset, which is used in income generating activities. So let's say you had an equip a plant equipment. You used it to generate income, right? Because of that wear and tear, the value of that asset went down. So to save you or to help you, to help your business further, the government says that you can claim tax depreciation on this item. So you will eventually pay less tax. Remember, this is not accounting depreciation. It remains as it was. Accounting depreciation is completely different. This is tax depreciation which compensates you for the value that you lost because of using that asset in generating your income because you are paying tax on your income, right? So the government is giving you a benefit that okay, 25% per year on reducing balance method for that particular assets price, we will give you a tax depreciation allowance remove that much tax depreciation allowance and then pay the tax. This is the benefit that the government is giving you. So which uh, expenses are allowable under tax, which expenses are not allowable under tax, you must be careful of, you must revise. This is there in your F1 syllabus beginning chapters. Next, tax losses can be carried forward indefinitely to offset against future tax profits. So tax loss carry forward is what they are speaking about over here. So what is a tax loss? You may be thinking. Remember again, I'm mentioning operating loss is different. In your business, you make a loss that's different. This is tax loss. Now a tax loss carry forward is a provision that allows a tax taxpayer to move a tax loss to future years to offset in a tax profit. It can be claimed by an individual or a business to reduce your future tax payments. This is a tax loss. Remember that not an operating loss. So tax loss operating loss are two different things. That is what they're mentioning over here. Next, sales tax is charged on all goods and the rate is 20%. Tax paid on inputs can be netted off against tax charged on outputs. All businesses are required to pay over the net amount due on a monthly basis. When you purchase, you pay sales tax. When you sell, you receive sales tax from the customer. So it nets off, right? That's what they're mentioning over here. Simple as that. Now, there is no question directly on tax, which is uh, which they ask generally, but this is important information. This is something that they've given us. So it's our job to analyze it. F1 cannot be taken lightly, specifically the tax aspect because they've given a whole page on it. So go through it. And after this entire marathon, we have come to the end of the pre-scene analysis. A lot of numbers a lot of technicalities, but trust me, go through it two times, three times, automatically, you will start to get comfortable with the stuff. Automatically, you will start to get comfortable with the writing. But go through it twice, two, three, four times. Listen to it like a movie. Listen to it. 100% you will benefit from the analysis. Thank you for being here. Pay close attention to the entire document. It is very important for you to go through this. Thank you.